Our ancestors valued navigation as a source of pride. The Pacific Ocean is big, really big. It stretches over 60 million square miles, a full 30% of Earth's total surface. Some of the tiny islands sprinkled throughout the Pacific can barely be seen on a map. But hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, the Polynesians figured out how to find a vast amount of them. Then, hundreds of years before Europeans ever set foot in the Americas, the Polynesians and the Native Americans met. The mystery of their meeting has left archaeologists and historians scratching their heads and is leading to a fundamental shift in our understanding of American history. Welcome back to Nutty History. Today, we're tracing DNA, exploring navigation techniques, and even looking at the story of a crazy Viking to figure out what happened when the Polynesians met the Native Americans. Thor Heyerdahl was a Norwegian adventurer and ethnologist on a mission. He had already eloped with his first wife to the tiny Pacific island of Fatu Hiva in French Polynesia. They'd been planning on pretty much just hanging out there and escaping from modern society. But island diseases got in the way of their plans, and they had to return to civilization. Then, in 1947, Thor built a raft and set off from Peru in search of Pacific islands far to the west. His aim was to prove that the Pacific islands had actually been settled by South Americans, and that it was possible for a simple canoe with a small sail to make the journey from the coast of Peru all the way to the scattering islands in the Pacific. Heyerdahl named his boat Kantiki, which was supposedly the original name of the Incan sun god Viracocha. Well, several things have been proven. Uh, one of them is uh, definitely that a Papyrus uh, vessel is uh, seaworthy. According to legend, Kantiki was the high priest and sun king of a legendary race of white men who built massive megalithic structures at Tiwanaku, a mysterious ancient site outside of La Paz, Bolivia, near Lake Titicaca. According to some Spanish accounts, which based on what ended up going down between the Spanish and the natives, it ended with a large death toll and can't be entirely trusted, the Incas told the conquistadors that a race of white gods had built the structures and then took off into the Pacific. Of course, this story was loved by many people with Aryan leanings, but while there's no evidence that Heyerdahl was a Nazi, he did pick up the story and run with it. His journey on Kantiki was successful, he sailed 5,000 miles in a primitive boat, proving that it was technically possible for early South Americans to basically drift towards the Pacific Islands, using the prevailing westward direction of winds and currents in the Pacific. Minus the boats of a superior white race aside, Heyerdahl might actually have been onto something. A recent genetic analysis has concluded that Polynesians and Native Americans did make contact with each other, and they made contact over 800 years ago. The study took the DNA of over 800 indigenous people from 17 groups in the Pacific Islands and 15 Native American groups from the Pacific coast of South America. One of the most intriguing theories about how this happened could prove Heyerdahl partially right. Not about the white men who mysteriously visited the continent, but about how South Americans from the Pacific coast could have managed to make their way into the eastern Pacific islands. It might seem like the most obvious answer to who these South Americans were is the Inca, the most advanced civilization in the region by far. However, the DNA evidence collected by researchers tells a different story. The genomes that were sequenced in the Marquesas, a small collection of islands way out in the middle of the Pacific, shared remarkable similarities with indigenous populations in Colombia and Ecuador, specifically a culture called the Zenu, which thrived in Colombia from 200 BC until around 1100 when their civilization began to decline and had nearly disappeared by the time the Spanish came around. The Zenu were no simple hunter-gatherer society. They were an advanced civilization that created some incredible art and were master goldsmiths and weavers. They also constructed a complex network of canals and waterworks and used canoes to traverse them. It's not a huge leap to think they might have ventured out into the Pacific, and the genetic evidence suggests that a small group of them did and could have landed in the Marquesas even before the Polynesians. At some point, the two seemed to get along pretty intimately and their bloodlines mixed. And there's more genetic evidence to back this theory up but instead of human DNA, it comes from a vegetable. The sweet potato is indigenous to South America, and at some point around the same time that Polynesian and South American genes began mixing, the orange tuber began growing on the Pacific Islands. But it could have also happened the other way around. 
The Polynesians were very experienced ocean navigators. Starting about 3,000 years ago, they managed to eventually settle over 1,000 islands in what's known as the Polynesian Triangle, a vast expanse of Pacific Ocean that stretches for 800,000 square miles. Some of the hops from island to island required thousands of miles of travel across open ocean, daring adventures into the unknown. The skill of these Polynesian seafarers is even more impressive because they made these incredible journeys without any navigational tools. Polynesian wayfaring was a deeply spiritual pursuit, one that was connected to the power and beauty of nature. Navigators were able to read things like ocean currents, know where certain stars rose and fell on the horizon, study the migratory patterns of birds, and observe the movements of clouds in the sky to figure out where the next patch of land was, even if it lay beyond the horizon. A 1976 voyage from Hawaii to Tahiti, a whopping 2,500 miles, by a Micronesian navigator named Mao Pialug, using only these traditional methods and a boat similar in style to those used by the ancient Polynesians, showed how this was possible. Mao was able to identify eight different types of swells and with a very sensitive understanding of how the swells behaved, could direct the boat steadily in the right direction. Another mysterious phenomenon that the Polynesians made use of was something called telapa. Telapa means flashing light. It is said to be a guiding light that the ancients would observe in very brief moments that would indicate where land was on the horizon. Telapa has never been recorded on camera, but its legend is one that widely circulates amongst Polynesian sailors. It's said to occur from a combination of ocean swells that move around the Pacific in predictable ways. Reading them carefully can help a master navigator know where the nearest land is. However, the source of the light itself is unknown. It might have something to do with electromagnetism. It might have something to do with the reflections of light across certain wave patterns. No matter the cause, though, Telapa is apparently a very brief event, something that the Polynesians of old were highly sensitive to something that had a powerful spirituality attached to it, and something that would help them guide towards the salvation of solid ground. So, considering this deep knowledge of navigation that the Polynesians had, it does make sense that they were the ones who made it to South America. The theory that the South Americans, South Americans, who by the way were not known so much for their seafaring expertise, made it to these tiny islands in the Pacific by accidentally drifting there seems pretty unlikely when you consider the mastery these Polynesians had over their watery environment. Another place where the Polynesians and South Americans could have met is Easter Island, also known as Rapa Nui. Famous for its giant Moai statues, Rapa Nui is so remote that finding it on a little outrigger canoe is basically the equivalent of throwing a dart at a board 50 feet away and hitting the bullseye but the Polynesians managed to do it. Estimates vary as to when they first arrived on the island. Some say they made landfall as early as 300 AD. Others put it much later, around 1200. Whenever they did, most of the genetic evidence suggested it was the Polynesians who made it to Rapa Nui first, not South Americans. But at some point, there was some pre-European mixing between the two groups, possibly first occurring in the mid-1300s. No one really knows whether it was the Polynesians who journeyed to South America and then brought their new lovers and offspring back to Rapa Nui, or if it was the other way around. But then the Easter Island society began to collapse. One popular theory about why this happened says that in their quest to carve out as many of those huge Moai heads as possible, the islanders cut down all the trees on the island, which led to starvation, warfare, and even anthropophagy. But another theory paints a different picture of what happened. It says that people didn't destroy the forests of Easter Island. Rats did. Polynesian rats, to be specific. Stowaways on some of the settlers' canoes, the rats quickly multiplied into the millions and became an invasive species. They feasted on palm tree roots and seeds, setting in motion a flurry of ecological mayhem that led to the extinction of many other plants and animals on the island. But society didn't collapse. The people of Rapa Nui adapted. Evidence from ancient garbage heaps shows that 60% of the refuge was rat bones, suggesting the invasive species became a source of food. Also, a creative farming technique called rock gardening allowed the islanders to maintain fertile soil to grow crops. Scattering broken stones in the dirt allowed the wind to release mineral nutrients from the rock and fertilize the soil. 
It was the servant trade that nearly wiped the people of Rapa Nui out completely, and in the process led to additional mixing between South Americans and Polynesians. In the midst of a desperate labor shortage, the Peruvian government decided to go steal people from the Pacific Islands. For one year, between 1862 and 1863, 32 Peruvian ships took more than 3,000 Polynesians and sent them to Peru to work as servants. Some 1,400 of them were from Rapa Nui, a full third of the island's population. After much international outcry, Peru stopped its brief foray into the servant trade. The Peruvian government returned the few who had survived. 470 were loaded on a ship bound for Easter Island, but smallpox ended most of them and only 15 made it back. Now, it may have been better if those 15 hadn't made it back, though, because smallpox exploded through the remaining population on the island. By 1877, just 110 people were still alive on the island. Contact between South Americans and Polynesians. Contact that could have occurred hundreds of years before Europeans even knew these places and cultures existed points to a rich pre-colonial history in both regions that we are still learning more about. More and more archaeological evidence is coming out that supports the idea that people were in the Americas far earlier than we thought. Footprints found in New Mexico's White Sands National Park, for example, have been dated to around 22,000 years ago, far earlier than the Bering Strait hypothesis that says humans migrated to the continent some 12,000 years ago. What else will we uncover in the years to come that may rewrite the history of the Americas? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History.